Optophobia, the fear of opening one's eyes. This podcast is dedicated to encouraging you, our listeners, to move beyond that fear, to solve riddles they don't want us to unriddle, to investigate supposedly ironclad truths, to unearth evidence buried for so long they believed it would stay buried. Season 2, Deep State. The Deep State is real. And it's just that, a 51st state, hidden from the American people, and unacknowledged by the federal government, even as it pulls the government's most important levers. How do you hide an entire state? You bury it. Deep. In Civics 101, we're taught the particulars of the visible constitutional state. The one you can visit in Washington. The one you vote for. Deep state is just a new term for a phenomenon that's influenced American democracy for 150 years. To many, it describes another more shadowy, more indefinable government. That description is accurate, but it's not the whole story. In July 1861, weeks after the first major fight of the Civil War, the first battle of Bull Run, members of President Lincoln's inner circle nervous about his chances at reuniting the nation, decided the country needed a backup plan in case the capital fell. They sent a small group of civil engineers called the Shovelmen to scout locations in the West. Today, some say the hole dug by the Shovelmen, believed to be underneath the Colorado-Wyoming border, houses a powerful bureaucracy rumored to be 600,000 strong. So why is a shadow government designed to silently run the real version of American democracy suddenly a regular topic of conversation within the constitutional state? Is there dissent in today's deep state? What's the ultimate goal of deep state leadership? This season on Optophobia, we'll track down the distortions, the assumptions, the omissions. Are you bored by the lies? Open your eyes. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Dylan Marshall. This is the last show of our season about the deep state, and my two co-hosts are joining me remotely. Muriel Walland is coming to us from Sheol, South Carolina, and Ford Hanger joins uh, the podcast from Saratoga Springs, New York. How are you guys doing? Doing fine, and despite the circumstances, you know, having the grandbabies at home during COVID-19. Yeah. Mira, you were, last time we talked last week, you were dealing with COVID-19, which is a special sort of shield. Yeah. It's, it's, I was explaining, it's a special thing that we're going through in Sheol right now. It's unprecedented, but everybody is, is stuck inside their homes because there are angry packs of crows and ravens and other corvids um, that are, are trolling the streets. And, and you need to be able to wear your protective equipment in order to, well, your pectective equipment in order to leave your house or else you'd be pecked to death. What is it called? What's the official name of the, the equipment, the basket, the meat basket on your head? Is it- I think it's, it's pe- pectective because it protects you from being pecked to death. But yeah, it's a meat basket and, and the crows will peck at the meat and not at your face, which is also meat. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, but there's not enough to go around, you know. It's just it's a it's a nightmare. But we're we're dealing. We're we're surviving. This is interesting because uh um you know upstate uh, Saratoga we're dealing with like a, a problem with birds too. We've uh, dealt with the murder of crows that's been happening. People up here not too bright. They keep thinking that this is like a bird flu. So anytime we uh, see any birds, people are killing birds. So there's been you know, a lot of dead birds just littered on the on the streets here and uh upstate new york and uh that's what i've been doing but i i've only seen that outside my house because i i don't leave i don't leave the compound what's the compound consist of the compound uh is what i call my parents house so during this time of quarantine ford you must be very much uh a republican oh yeah i mean we should open up immediately i don't know why we shut down to begin with that's what i've been screaming day one 
was uh, money can't stop flowing. So, but I will say every time I take a walk outside, I start saying to myself, man, I'm so thankful for the things I've got. I'm so thankful for my parents. I'm so thankful. You know, I feel bad for the guy who's working at the restaurant who lost his job because of the COVID. And then as soon as I step my feet inside my house, I say, fuck him. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that it turns on and off like that. As soon as that door frame is really a... Genetics are what they are. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the course of this season and... Oh. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That was just a crow at my door trying to peck his way in. <coughs> sorry. I just... I just shot it. That's what the Corvids sound like? No, that was him at the doorbell. That was him ringing the doorbell because that's the thing is that they make you think that they're people and not Corvids. And then you go out thinking it's oh, they're smart. Amazon or something. And it's it's just a bunch of crows and they peck you to death. They tried to open back up and shield, but then people were going to Walmart and just being ripped apart. <laughs> so uh, there was a big difference in our two seasons so far, uh, it might've been beginner's luck last season, but we actually solved the mystery we had been discussing in our first season. By the time of our finale, there was a little bit of a, a controversy. I don't know if you guys were listeners to the last season of, of the podcast, but there was some controversy in that last show because my two co-hosts disagreed with the truth behind what we had discovered, but it was fine. Our producers were happy and it was actually a pretty satisfying ending for our first time out. That did not happen this time for our our sophomore season. Optophobes will remember that the big clue last season came from a listener who found an old letter in her father's glove box that definitively solved the Cagnew Station puzzle. This season... Definitively. Definitively, yeah. And... This season, I thought it was going to be the same thing. We had we had a listener send a letter, and the really the second half of the season was deeply influenced by this listener-sourced historical research about the origins of the deep state. So I'm going to get to that history a little bit later in the episode, and also to the reason that this finale feels so different to me than the first season. Months ago, when we started this, I said that we were going to try to answer some foundational questions about the deep state. So what does the deep state want? What motivates its residents? Is it all about power? Uh, and I also said that we would get into some of the details about the, what the deep state really is. So where is it exactly? How did it begin? How was it built? Who lives there? Are they allowed to leave and come back? What does an underground city look like, which Muriel, you were especially uh, helpful with because you've built those. And I think we answered some of those questions through the interviews we did with our, with our guests. I wanted to ask both of you guys how the season may have like altered your views about the deep state, or if you learned anything about the deep state. So I'm wondering Muriel, from your point of view, how, if anything has changed for you and Sheol as we've examined the deep state over the last few months? I have just been enjoying this process of learning more and more about the deep state from our wonderful guests. I've just been eating my popcorn, sitting back and listening and just drawing these connections in my brain, you know? And there's just definitely something to this theory that they're taking a little, little bitty foreskin calamaris and they're taking them, incubating them, and they're turning them into tweens, just like Ford and my grandbabies. And I think that if you were to follow that foreskin all the way back to the deep state, you're going to go down there, you're going to dig down, you're going to find a whole society of 1850s people living amongst the celebrities that we thought had perished. Do Mephistopheles and Paxton and Behemoth, do they know anything about the deep state have you have are they old enough yet for you to have that conversation with them well i think besides probing their memories which i've done and it's been blank so i think they were wiped i have not had that conversation with them yet i think you should have that conversation you think so ford yeah there is a conversation you gotta have is like uh the guardian 
the tough conversations fall to you? You know, I just I just wanted to safely usher them through puberty and then have that conversation with them when they are men um, and they can handle that information. It gets harder. When they become men, they shut down emotionally. So you might want to start now. The, the younger they are, the more that you could reach them. Afford. Muriel, one of the things I've, you know, when you're sitting across a microphone from somebody who is your co-interviewer, you notice some patterns. One thing I noticed about how you, or I guess a line of questioning that you repeated to a lot of our guests was about, you often ask them about a moment in their childhood or another time in their life when maybe some Latin might have come in to or like a promise that they were asked to make or something that they really wanted. Uh, and then maybe a deal was brokered. Now, Dylan, that's just the businesswoman in me, okay? I know that in order to be able to achieve your dreams, to get what you want to happen in the world, you have to sometimes make a deal. And, you know, a lot of times these people, these successful people that we have as guests on our podcast, they have often had similar experiences where, you know, they've, they've had this seminal moment, seminal moment in their life where, where, you know, maybe like a demon or something has spoken to them and, and really set them on the course for their future success. Cause it's just, you know, it happens, it happens in so many cases. Yeah. So this was something that you were interested in exploring and it, it seemed like you thought that this was usually a time at which there was a change in their life or some important impact in their life. Yes. I mean, as a businesswoman, I've seen that myself, you know, coming in and making a deal that um, that just sets somebody on the course for future success, you know? So Ford, I wonder if you... Call me Cliff. <laughs> Cliff, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about this uh, journey that you had over the season where you learned little bits of information about your own past on the show, maybe not something that you expected, and where you where you are with all that right now. Ever since Bert Flapp reversed Solomon Northrop me and stole me from the deep state and sent me to upstate New York in Saratoga Springs, I've sworn since I, you know, since I could speak English properly that I can't be from here. No one, no one, I don't act like anyone from here. We don't have anything in common. I, I swear my parents are my real parents. Um, so, you know, that's been my story the whole time. Um, I got a, a comment on one of my uh, YouTube unboxings. They said, hey, we heard you on the podcast. Why don't you just do a 23 Me?" I said, I hope that's not like a swingers thing, 23 people me because I'm not into I'm not into that. He said, nope, it's a DNA test. You'll find out who your parents really are. So uh Dylan, I purchased the 23 Me. I took the DNA test and um my parents are my parents, I found out. They are or are they not? Oh they're not. They are my parents. Wow. So that tells me that uh, the deep state is in the DNA game now. Right. They clearly are planting, you know, all the information that they don't, they want to keep you away from the truth. So even when I send in my DNA to a third party, they've reached that third party. They intercepted it. They intercepted it and sent it back telling me that, nope, these are your parents and they want me to just deal with it. Because you, you've seen people all the time when they find out that who their family is, they're like, oh, I guess this is my family, you know, not me. I completely reject that test, and I'm going to be taking uh, as many DNA and ancestral tests as I can until I get to the bottom of it. So that's that's kind of where I've landed. Even though my mom and my dad do look like two halves of me, I swear one of these tests will show the truth. Right now, most of my unboxing videos are me unboxing the test results. But it doesn't matter what's in them. No, I just do it in the box. Just do it, just do it in the box. And then off off camera, I look at the results. Are you getting a lot of your packages on time these days? No, that's another thing that's uh, become so, somewhat of a problem. Because as you know, uh, in the unboxing world, we live and die by the postal service. <laughs> yeah. By how fast they can deliver something. So with this uh, COVID-19 happening, you know, my packages are all delayed. So I haven't been able to make as many videos as I it could be. And and now my entire audience is doing nothing but sitting at home. This is the perfect time to be making videos. Mm. So, um, you know, it's really hit me hard. And you know, I'm already on hard times living, living in a house where now all three people in my family have seen my penis. 
That must be tough. Yeah, it's, it, it doesn't it doesn't make dinners easier. All right, let's take a quick break, and we will be right back with Muriel and Ford. Hey, Optophobes. First, the good news. We've introduced you this season to a number of Blend Venom Solutions products. Tinctures, balms, unctions, and eyewashes, all designed to soothe your biggest anxieties and eliminate your fears. Those moments of dread are familiar to everyone, and that's why we targeted them. Fears like having to talk to someone in line at the grocery store who you vaguely know, but not enough to want to talk to. Or having to attend a baby shower. Those may be mundane terrors, but Blend Venom Solutions also makes unguents that let you conquer your fear of rejection, avoid uncertainty, confront unwanted change, and be confident you'll make your connecting flight in Houston. Each of our ointments, from Kananga Pit Viper Gels to Mozambique Tambati Clarity Paste to Chinchilla Death Adder Oil, is made from the poison of venomous snakes, blended with flora from the part of the world where that snake lives. And they're all safe. We're pretty sure of that because we develop each of our products by testing them on the residents of the polyps at Jonathan Winter's elder care community in Shalimar County, Florida, where Blend Venom Solutions is headquartered. So that's the good news. The bad news is a little harder to explain. The bulk of our sales are for products that aid social anxiety. And because we're all stuck at home, the socially anxious are all living their best pandemic. Also, the retired attorneys at the Polyps at Jonathan Winters have been very busy over the last few months holding off EPA agents and dealing with a class action lawsuit claiming Blend Venom Solutions, quote, traffics in substances dangerous to living organisms when applied internally or externally that destroy the action of vital functions and prevent the continuance of life, end quote. Also, our acquisition of some smaller venom ointment competitors like Fang Juice Corp. and the Slither Spit Fund may have been a mistake. All of which means we're going to take the summer to huddle in Shalimar County, Florida, and regroup. It may be that in the future, Blend Venom Solutions goes an entirely different direction. One suggestion from a retired butcher who lives at the Polyps at Jonathan Winters is a line of cold-cut flavored energy sodas. Keep your ears on this space. Okay, we are back. In our very first show, we quoted a congressional staffer who's largely credited with applying the term deep state to our current political situation. So in his 2016 book called The Deep State, The Fall of the Constitution and the Rise of a Shadow Government, Mike Lofgren wrote that, yes, there is another government concealed behind the one that is visible at either end of Pennsylvania Avenue, a hybrid entity of public and private institutions ruling the country according to consistent patterns in season and out, connected to but only intermittently controlled by the visible state, whose leaders we choose. So what we explored over the last several months was the idea that the deep state is not just simply, quote, a state within a state hiding mostly in plain sight, whose operators mainly act in the light of day, as Lofgren put it, but an actual 51st state buried under rangeland along the Colorado-Wyoming border. Its residents, powerful actors connected to shadowy influential figures in Silicon Valley, Wall Street, the Pentagon, the intelligence services and the courts. So just like Ford and Muriel had certain things that they were interested in exploring during this season, I spent a lot of time this season examining the origins of the deep state, thinking that hidden history would reveal truths about today's deep state. That history can be divided into two types, the known history and the unknown history. So the known history was mostly as the name implies, well-known, and is as follows. In in July of 1861, the Confederates had won the first major fight of the war, the first Battle of Bull Run, just 30 miles outside of Washington, D.C. Weeks later, members of President Lincoln's inner circle, nervous that Jefferson Davis had come close to taking Washington, decided the country needed a backup plan to protect the constitutionally elected government in case the Capitol fell. So they sent a small group of civil engineers to scout locations in the West, 
where the Republic could relocate if the Confederacy prevailed. Those engineers called themselves the Shovelmen, and when they found a location they believed had the right variables for an underground bunker, they began to dig. Lincoln's government, of course, never needed the bunker, but it was never abandoned. It grew in the decades and decades after that, and now it houses this phenomenon we've been talking about all season called the Deep State, which many believe is an underground metropolis the size of Baltimore. The unknown history was fed to us during this season in small bits of information by a scholar named Todd Snosh, who is researching a book about a famous Diplodocus dinosaur fossil and its connection to Andrew Carnegie's espionage activities for President Theodore Roosevelt. Snosh is doing his research, or so he told us, in Medicine Bow, Wyoming, very close to where it's always been rumored that the shovelman dug Lincoln's bunker. That's important because if we can locate the precise place where the shovelman dug, we can get a better handle on where today's deep state lies. So anyway, Snosh is doing his own research. He stumbles on documents that appear to be everything from the original orders to send the shovelman west at the beginning of the Civil War to letters between Lincoln's spiritual advisor and the shovelman. So these letters include new details never seen by any researcher before about everything from the exact location of the bunker to its dimensions and layout. And most interestingly, the letters reveal an evolving relationship between the shovelman and the hundreds of dinosaur bones that were strewn around the bunker entrance in the mid 19th century. So the shovelmen were alone in Western American wilderness for years. And according to these letters uncovered by Snosh, at first they see the bones as nuisances. And then eventually they discover that the bones can be used in the construction of the bunker itself and even as decoration and furniture for Lincoln's underground office. And at particularly low moments, the bones seem to have been objects of romantic interest for the men. And eventually, by the end of the war, the shovelmen come to worship the bones as gods and dream of sacrificing their own children to honor them. So Snosh had been sending more and more useful information like this each week, his emails getting longer and more detailed. And then suddenly, a few weeks ago, his emails just stopped. So I'd been emailing Todd about coming on the show and had also been asking him more about where exactly he'd found this trove of amazing shovelman history. And then two weeks ago, I got a message from his account that just said, who are you? Which I thought was really strange since we'd been going back and forth for months. And then this week I got an email from a Rebecca Harrison that was both clarifying and infuriating. It said, quote, dear Mr. Marshall, I've just listened to the second season of Optophobia, and I have some bad news. And then there's like a sad face emoji. The person that you've been corresponding with, Todd Snosh, is my son, Bryce. It's actually Bryce and his best friend, Nestor. They're 13 and in eighth grade at Hawthorne Middle School here in New Jersey. They were doing a report for school about Dippy the famous dinosaur find in Wyoming. And then there's like a dinosaur emoji that she puts in there. And at the same time, somehow stumbled on your podcast. Then they decided to be 13 year old boys. And that's basically the end of the story. Very sorry, Rebecca. And then there's another sad face emoji with a glass of scotch emoji next to it. So as I said, at the beginning of this episode, that's not super satisfying personally for me. Um, but while, while we may have been duped by a couple of zitty little shits about some deep state history, the expertise of our various guests shined, I think, a much needed light on how we are all living now with the deep state today. Can we, uh, back up where you said we got duped? 
it sounds sounds like you got duped. You got catfished. I personally did, but I, I guess I mean me and all all the producers of Optophobia, the whole all the staff. I don't know if we should all be. Should we all be falling on that bullet? No, not you guys. You guys, you guys had your contributors. You had lots of great stuff to bring to the show. I'm talking about the people who made the mistakes running the show. Okay, so all the mistakes are you. Are you guys? Dylan, I'm sorry you fell for that. I should have known it was tweens. That has Todd Snosh had tween written all over him. If I know anything about tweens, is that they will they will dupe you and they will gaslight you until until you don't know who you are anymore. Because my grandbabies do it all the time. I'm sure your grandbabies don't do that kind of thing. Oh, they do that kind of thing. I mean, I told I told you about Call of, Call of Duty. They're playing Call of Duty and and just you know making you think that they're pooping all over the house and. I've just, I've had it up to my eyeballs with tweens and I've got a lot of eyeballs in my home. Well, thank you for, I'm sorry, Dylan. Thank you for the sympathy, Muriel. Dylan, what would you give for me to make those producers that let this happen go away? Cause I will, I will make them go away for you. I would maybe give a couple fingers. Okay, great. We can make that happen. You mean like you'd flick them off? You flick off your producer? No, I mean, like you could take a couple fingers off of my hand. Oh, okay. I thought you meant you'd flip them off because you're so mad that they are so stupid. No. That they got duped by these tweens. Other guests have said similar, what would you give answers to Muriel when she's asked that question? It just seemed like a good one. Oh, okay. Well, she never asked me. So. Ford, I did ask you, remember? I asked you when I was Giselle Boonshin and I appeared in your room in that poster and I spoke to you in Latin. Holy crap, that was you? Of course it was me, Ford. Oh, Ford, you thought that was a hypothetical? I thought it was a hypothetical. I thought I... I'm a friggin' demon, okay? Holy crap. Jesus! That's blowing my mind right now. Why did you think I was being so cagey every time everybody asked me how I spoke to the Shovelman in 1861 and I gave them the whole theme song as a new anthem for their country? Goodness gracious. I thought you were Giselle. I'm a demon. I thought Giselle was in my house. Okay, I live in Shio. So I've been catfished. I'm sorry I duped you, but you know what? That's just what that's just what tweens and demons do is we dupe and we have a little fun. We we mess around with humans. So I've been I've been catfished. I don't have a oh God, I don't have a crew to blame it on. Ford, I thought we talked I thought for sure that time we went out for beers after the show that time that we talked about this and you knew that Muriel is a demon. We may have, but I, you know me, I like to drink. I drank you under the table. So yeah. Well, every time. Yeah. We would, I was drowning. So I probably don't remember it. And then also, you know, I mean, I don't know what the doctor did when he brought me here, what stuff they put in my memory to wipe it. I don't know what stuff they put in your memory either. Cause they've been, they put in my grandbaby's memories too. Okay. And I mean, I might be a demon, but I'm not omnipotent or omniscient. Okay. Muriel Ford, let me ask you one more question before the, we end the show. It's the same final question we ask a lot of our guests. What do you guys think that the deep state is ultimately after? You know, what, is our, what does our 51st state and only underground state want from the rest of America? I think they're uh, cata- cataloging all of our blood and DNA so that they can replace us completely. That's what I think. I think they're cataloging us, sending us out to find the version of us that looks our doppelganger, kill it, and then they take our place. So they have eyes and ears everywhere. That's grim. Mary, what do you think? I think that's part of it too, Ford. Yeah, I, I think I agree. I just I believe that this goes deeper than politics. This goes all the way down to the human being's fear of their ultimate destiny, which is either to go upstairs or downstairs. And these people are just staying in their living room. And that living room, that eschatological living room, is the deep state. And they are managing to avoid death by eating little bit of babies' foreskins. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there for now. We will be back for season three of Optophobia starting next week. We will have two new co-hosts who will help me look into a number of theories about the virus that's changing the world, Kofefi-19. 
But with season two now in our rearview mirror, I want to thank my two amazing co-hosts for their contributions and insightful questioning of our guests, Muriel Walland and Clifford Hanger. Thank you, guys. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Dylan. And thank you for listening to Optophobia. I'm Dylan Marshall. See you next season. You can find us on our website at optophobia.org or on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at at optophobes. And please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Liz Sanders played Muriel Woland. Liz performs with Madeline, a Washington Improv Theater house ensemble. Jamal Newman played Clifford Hanger. Jamal performs with Lena Dunham and Nixon. You can follow him on Instagram and Twitter at at Hello Newman and find him at jamalnewman.com. Optophobia was produced by Tim Townsend. Music by Bart Warshaw. Cover art by Claire Smalley. Website by Chance Griffin. Thanks for listening. Until next week, keep them open.